Okay, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Comunidad, the first conference of its kind for Filipino American law students, put on by the Filipino Bar Association of Northern California, F Bank, and the Bay Area Palace Coalition. I'm Janice Riker, co director of the F Bank Mentorship Committee, along with Antonio Raimundo. And here with me as well is our president of F Bank, Jennifer Santa Ana. We have an exciting program for you today. The schedule is on the website, fbank.org slash comunidad. And also in the event program you received by email this morning. This is a hybrid event. The program, programming is virtual over Zoom until a little bit after one o'clock. Then from four to 7 p.m., we are going to have an in-person happy hour at Drake's dealership in Oakland. Hope you can all make it. I'm going to give you a short overview of our panels today and how to access them. To access the links for the various panels today, please go to fbank.org slash comunidad and click on the orange yellow box that says, click here to watch comunidad. The password is history. If you're watching this now, you are already in the right place for the first panel, which will discuss mental health issues facing law students and lawyers. At 11 a.m., we will have two concurrent panels you can choose from. One is geared towards law students earlier in their law school careers, how to find success in your summer job. The second panel is about practicing law as a person of color. You'll choose the link for one of those panels at 11 o'clock. At 11.50, you'll go into a new link on the website to be separated out into breakout rooms for networking. There will be two 10 minute sessions where you'll be able to meet some of the other attendees of Comunidad. From 12.10 to 12.20, you'll have a short 10 minute break, just a few minutes to go grab your lunch. And at 12.20, we are honored to have our keynote speech from Alameda County Commissioner Palayo A. Yamas Jr., who is also a candidate for the Alameda County Superior Court bench this year. FBank President-elect Raymond Roland will be leading a fireside chat with the commissioner as well. A little after one o'clock, that will conclude our virtual program. From four to 7 p.m., we'll have our happy hour at Drake's in person in Oakland. Smart casual dress is fine. And finally, I want to mention the FBank Foundation and Change Lawyers are offering a $5,000 scholarship for a 3L or recent graduate to help with preparing for the California bar exam. The deadline to apply is tomorrow, February 28th. And for more information, please go to fbank.org slash foundation. Thank you for attending Comunidad. Now I will hand it over to this year's FBank president, Jennifer Santana. Thank you so much, Janice. Good morning, everyone. Magandang umaga. And welcome to FBank's third annual Comunidad Conference. My name is Jennifer Santa Ana, president of FBank. I'm also a trial attorney at the US Department of Labor, Office of the Solicitor, where I enforce federal laws born out of the labor and civil rights movements of our country. As some of you may know and have already heard from Janice, um, Comunidad was envisioned by FBank president-elect Raymond Rowland and executed alongside FBank's law student members in 2019. The success of the conference to spur the growth of our future leaders in the law was recognized nationally last year by the American Bar Association's Young Lawyers Division. Now, some of you may not know that Ray and I are real life best friends. Our origin story started in law school 10 years ago where we served as co-presidents of the Filipino American Law Society or PALS at the University of San Francisco. At that time, we were incentivized to meet with other Filipinx identifying law students in the Bay Area. At a modest restaurant across Hastings, Ray reminded me this morning it was Chambers. I don't know if that still exists, um, but there we met with Nelson Lamb, who at the time was president of PALS at UC Hastings. Angelica Leonardo, who was the founder of PALS at Golden Gate University, and Leo Cristobal, a student leader and another GGU PALS member. We knew 
only a handful, if not less, of Filipinx identifying law students at our respective schools. Collectively, we knew of only 15 or so in the Bay Area. I share this with you because our theme for this year's Comunidad and for FBank's 41st year is no history, no self. Today, Leo is FBank's treasurer and counsel for California Fran the California Franchise Tax Board. Angelica is FBank's secretary and a deputy public defender for Solano County. Nelson is FBank's vice president and counsel at Uber. And Ray is FBank's president elect and deputy city attorney for San Francisco. And for the years that we've been on the FBank board together, we have been able to create nationally recognized programming to diversify the bench and the bar. And today we now stand before nearly, nearly 100 attendees throughout the country. I know my journey in developing my practice has been ever more fruitful with the help of Leo, Angelica, Nelson and Ray and the rest of the FBank family. It's because being the only one in the room doesn't stop in law school. Justice Goodwin Liu shared with the, L with the LA Times that although Asian Americans are the largest minority group in big firms, they have the highest attrition rate and rank lowest in the ratio of partners to associates. Asian Americans comprise a good segment of the US population, but only 3% of federal judges and 2% of state judges identify as Asian Americans. If we were to di disaggregate the data, I wouldn't be surprised if the statistics for Filipinx identifying judges were painfully lower. The work and extra work to prove yourself as a person of color in this profession will not end once you're a lawyer. But no, truly know that you're not alone in this path. For 41 years, FBank has been here and there to lift our community up to forge pathways in places that deemed were deemed near impossible. But with FBank by your side, we've been able to see a California Supreme Court justice, a California Attorney General, and a number of Supreme Court judges, or excuse me, let me correct myself, I, I wish. Um, but right now, a number of Superior Court judges rise in the ranks. There is a real beauty in this community. It wholeheartedly and deeply cares about your success. I know, and I would, I know I would not be where I am today without this family. So I end by saying my warmest welcome to you and thank you for adding your valued perspective to this profession. And I'll hand it back over to Janice. Thanks so much, Jen. And with that, we will start our first panel today, mental health issues relating to law students and attorneys. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, magandang umaga. Thank you, Janice, for the warm introduction and Jennifer for that really powerful message. It really is a reminder that we stand on the shoulders of giants uh, my name is Marjan Chrisabubo. I'm a 3L at UC Davis, and I will be kicking off um, our mental health panel this morning as a co-moderator. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. First, this panel will be recorded, but we will adhere to the best we can to the Vegas rule, which is whatever is said here stays here, but please feel free and encouraged to practice what is learned here. Second, we will have a question and answer portion at the ends, and so please send all questions via the Q&A function and not the chat function. Uh, given the time constraints, we may not get to your question. question. Um, and if we don't, and if you wanna get in contact with our panelists, uh, please feel free to reach out to Antonio or Janice after this panel or when you are able and willing. Uh, speaking of panelists, I'm very excited to um, introduce our panelists this morning. We'll start off with Rowan Gia Samuels, Rowan is a licensed uh, marriage and family therapist specializing in working with Filipino, Filipinx patients. She is a, a Tagalog speaking psychotherapist, a laughter yoga teacher, and a hypnotherapist. 
Dr. Linda Yoruba has served as a psychologist at Berkeley Law for many years. She obtained her, JD, or her PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Minnesota and her master's in counseling from the University of Colorado. Karen Ye is a licensed marriage and family therapist specializing in working with attorneys and other high pressure professionals. She is a former patent litigator and obtained her JD from the University of Pennsylvania Carey School of Law. Christina Kinsella is a supervising clients rights advocate with the Disability Rights um, California Office of Clients Rights Advocacy. She obtained her JD at Thomas Jefferson School of Law and has an LM in International Human Rights Law. So please give a round to our very esteemed panelists. Thank you all for being here this morning. And with that, I'm gonna uh, pass the baton off to Danny. Hi, my name is Danny Silva, she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm a 2L at the University of San Francisco and I will be one of your moderators today. Um, to give a roadmap about what our panel is, our panel today wants to address the many ways in which Philippine X culture overlaps with the legal profession, specifically in the topic of mental health. This includes cultural expectations and our unique perspectives, as well as other resources we may use like seeking professional help or addressing mental health concerns. Some of the topics today uh, we give today may be triggering. So if you need to take a break for yourself, please do whatever you feel necessary. To mention, our panel today will be recorded. Today, we are breaking the panel up into three sections. First, we'll be identifying mental health concerns and how they overlap with Philippine X culture. Next, we'll identify if and how to access certain resources for maintaining mental health. And finally, we'd love to discuss how law students can think about building useful toolkits for managing stress and mental health issues. Additionally, at the end of the panel, we'll have a brief Q&A based on any topics, questions shared in the chat by our audience. Please use the Q&A chat to submit questions and two or three will be chosen by, the moder by moderator Jamie um, at the end if we have time. We also have made a public chat available to encourage engagement and share how you may feel about some of the topics brought up during the panel. However, we please ask that everyone uses the chat function respectfully and avoid messages that may be triggering for others. That said, uh, Marjan, you can start off with the questions. Thanks, Danny. So I wanna, I think the best way to kick off this panel is to kind of just begin and lay the groundwork. And so the first subject we'll discuss is identifying mental health concerns, um, specifically as it relates to the intersection of Filipinx culture and mental health. Um, one of the key issues for this panel is how being a Filipino American who is building a professional career can impact one's mental health. Part of this involves values that started in the Philippines and then brought it along with you to the US with folks who have moved to the country. Um, and we as law students are those who are immigrants or who have been raised by them. Um, and it's just kind of bringing all that together and figuring out how those values come into play uh, when, as we navigate the legal profession. So my first question is for Rowan. Um, Rowan, how have you seen cultural values or expectations impact mental health in Filipino Americans here in the US, uh, potentially drawing off of the cultural cl clash or kind of familial expectations um, or in terms of raising children or just kind of navigating all that? Um, maybe there are, you know, key examples you can discuss are cultural values that start in the Philippines, but which impact uh, our community here in the U.S. Thank you, Marjan, for that question. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I'm a student of the culture and a, a culture question in a few minutes to, to respond to that is a feat, so I will do my best. Um, I want to begin by sharing with you that the orientation of the Filipino child and the American child, and then I'm gonna go back to the Filipino American experience. Um, so the Filipino child and the American child orientation is very different. I actually printed a couple of my slides from one of my presentations so I could illustrate it. So I'm gonna show you real quick. So this is the Filipino, this is the home. Okay, so in the context of the Filipino culture, this is the home. The goal of the, the parents is to prepare the child to be an effective member of a group. And if that's so, then the he 
can soar as an individual. You're probably wondering how in the Filipino culture, so I'm talking more in the motherland, how this is honed. In many ways, there's a lot more teasing that happens with a parent and a child diet. So how would that look like? Like even with food, teasing a baby with food, um, and also rehearsing, I call that rehearsing. So you might be familiar with this. Maybe your parents would ask you, huh, what would you do a nap, my child? If I'm old, would you just throw me on the curb or, you know? And so the child usually would respond and it's usually a rehearsal back and forth. Um, there's also um, a lot of uh, clues in our language such as iyak, iyakan, which means playing like we're crying or galit, galitan, which means pretend like we're angry. And so the child is home to read nonverbal cues because the proximity of the Filipino and the Filipino culture, that bubble, is so much narrower. If you've been in the islands, people in the jeepney are very comfortable being close together, knees to knees, elbows to elbows. We even do a piano, which is somebody is moving forward, somebody's moving, just so we can squeeze together, right? So the orientation is very different. There is a core value called pakiramdam, which is sensing the other beyond words. So what is that? You know, it's like if you think of a signage without words, that is pakiramdam. But there's a lot of practice that occurs. Now, sharing is rewarded. If you know how to share your space, that's a very valuable um, core value in the Philippines. Now, in, in America, the orientation is different. Um, so here, I have another illustration from one of my present From the home, the role of the parent is to prepare the child to um, be in his own space, to be more independent. So then he could be part of a, a group, a community. So the moment a child could um, steady his neck, a baby, right? We put a child in the high chair and we start giving that child food so they could be independent. Um, the ability to self-soothe, you know, so if we bring our child to daycare or to grandma, uh, that is something that's very important. The right for self-determination, right? Uh, I have kids, I'm homeschooling my kids right now, even in first grade. Uh, the core curriculum of first grade in the States is uh, stating your op opinion. Would you rather, would you rather take the bike or the bus, right? Um, now, it's not that that's not important in the uh, Philippine culture, but the word is emphasize, okay? It's not that in America we don't want to share, but that's more emphasized in, in the Filipino culture. Um, you know, we have crazy hot days in school where we reward uniqueness, right, in the, in the American culture. So now going back to the Filipino-American experience, um, imagine having to reconcile both cultures, right? Having to verbalize your need, but at home, you need to verbalize it, but with a certain inflection and tone. Otherwise, maybe the immigrant parent might say, ah, you know, that seem, uh, that can be disrespectful. Um, now, this sensing pakiramdam causes a lot of tension because the Filipino American child sees the peers and it's like why can't you tell me you love me I, I hear that all the time you must not love me like that's so easy to do right stating is very important for the immigrant parent sensing is very important why can't you sense me anak you must not care about me if you can't sense me pakiramdam is a very opposite um core value in in those two cultures so the mental health uh, in exchange, we're missing each other's love cues, right? Um, we might feel like we're huddled together, but still feeling lonely, right? Feeling like we're not good enough. Like, am I my burden to you? Like, I feel like I can't meet your standard. Um, that affects our self-esteem. Um, feeling like we're always having to hustle, if you will, right? Um, um, and so those have really, uh, you know, mental health implications for Filipino American. Yeah, I think my time is up. Thank you, Marjan. 
No, thank you. I think, uh, you know, I was born in the Philippines and grew up in the U.S., so there's very much that interplay that um, I didn't quite know how to put into words. So you're putting everything into the vernacular for me and really uh, kind of putting it into place. Um, I guess, Karen, I, I want to share that same question with you, and we'd love for you to share any thoughts that you may have specific to the context of, you know, your your uh, experience as a former attorney. And we understand that you used to be a practicing attorney and now you treat lawyers in your practice. So have, how have you seen cultural values or expectations impact mental health in lawyers or other similar professional fields? Yeah, first I wanna say that description of the cultural difference was amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, I also, I work with a lot of the Asian Americans, and so I do talk about the difference between our culture of origin or our culture at home and our mainstream culture that we grow up in. Um, what you just described was obviously specific to the Philippine X culture, and that was beautiful. I can't wait to think more about that. Um, but I've also seen, you know, with Asian Americans, our culture at home is much more collectivist, right? Um, and in addition to that, when you have the, you know, international immigration experience, there's the um, added expectation that our families have for what we do because they sacrificed. They have their trauma, not just the trauma of where they came from, but also the trauma of picking themselves up from a place of support and understanding and belonging, and then moving entirely, up, uprooting their life to a completely opposite culture. For them, that is their own trauma, right? And then for the children of those families, um, it can be a lot of pressure and expectation of how we kind of give back. Um, so I do a lot of the work I do with my Asian American clients, particularly the ones who pursue prestigious careers, which are usually high pressure, high paying. Um, there comes a point maybe earlier or later in life where you begin to figure out that you have these conflicting values that live inside you that you've internalized from both sets of cultures. And people who come to me have to figure out which do they choose? Which values do they choose to prioritize over another? And I help people understand that when they choose, they sacrifice one, at least a little bit. And to learn how to be okay with that, to learn how to navigate the guilt and the tension and also the relationships where they do have to compromise and sacrifice a little bit. But if you can distill down which values you choose, then you can live more in alignment with the value that you believe is more important, which leads to more contentment, a sense of grounded, groundedness and self-worth. Um, so that's a difficult process, but it leads to something a little bit more fulfilling. The other thing that I see a lot with um, Asian Americans and children of immigrants is something that aligns very heavily in the lawyer culture is productivity and perfectionism as self-worth, right? Productivity is something that is in, in both cultures really, and then especially emphasized in law firm culture with the billable hour and the expectation that you, you know, time is money and there's no such thing as time off. Um, you know, as a litigator at the firm that I was at, and most litigators are, are like this, there's no vacation days, right? Technically endless vacation days, but really what that means is you have no, no, time for yourself at all. Every moment of your life is given to the job, right? Um, so I know we're going to talk about compassion fatigue later, and it kind of plays into that, but figuring out um, how, to, how to find other things that make you feel worthy, give you a sense of self-worth other than productivity and perfectionism. No, I think, Karen, that's so 
like insightful, um, especially for the, you know, law students who are going to begin their professional careers very soon. It's a lot of reconciling and reckoning with, you know, what does it mean to hold the, these different values, but also truly find something that is fulfilling um, and that is sustainable. So I think both you and Rowan like really got to the foundation of what this panel is about. I'm really excited to um, continue on. So I'm gonna pass it on to Danny, um, who will be moderating the next set. Hi all, uh, yes. Thank you so much to Rowan and Karen for really addressing how culture intersects with not only the lawyer culture, but mental health. Um, we're going to talk now about, like Karen had mentioned, compassion fatigue. Um, so this is a question directed to Karen, Linda, and Christina. Uh, some attorneys may enter into a field that's very demanding of compassion or may involve more sensitive topics, leading to something we call compassion fatigue. What are some ways of identifying when a law student or attorney may be affected by it and methods of still being mindful and resonating with that compassion without unduly affecting one's mental health? Uh, we can, yes, it seems like Karen really wants to jump in on the question first. No, I was just gonna say, I think you had a plan for Linda to ah, go Linda, first. Could you um, please jump in first then? Uh, Linda, you're currently muted. Sorry about that. I could answer when you couldn't hear a thing. So um, anyway, talking a little bit about compassion fatigue, I first want, you know, it really, another word for it is vicarious trauma, which means, and I hear this a lot, my experience is mostly with law students um, in terms of some of the some of the externships and work that they do, or even in the classroom, hearing particularly in criminal law, um, some of the obviously awful stories. But compassion fatigue really has to do with um, feeling, how you identify it is when you feel exa physically exhausted or psychologically exhausted from basically the stories you either hear in the classroom or the work that you're doing with people. Um, and you have to recognize when you start to feel maybe hopeless or powerless, or, you know, I can't, what can I do for this person or for this situation? Um, or feeling taking on their experiences as you listen to the stories um, can be very painful. So you just have to be aware of your feelings. Um, if you all of a sudden, maybe you're not even thinking, oh, my feelings, but you realize that you're in your work that you're doing, or even in the classroom, you feel more irritable, maybe start to even feel angry. And then kind of the, uh, along with that, maybe actually just even feeling numb. If you think, boy, I'm listening to all these stories, but I don't feel anything. Um, it, that's an, also just to trigger maybe to, for you to realize, ah, this is what we call compassion fatigue. Um, and also just maybe just being detached. So either sometimes in the beginning, you feel a lot of those feelings, the, the anger, the powerlessness, what can I do? And then sometimes it grows actually into feeling, as I said, just numb or detached. That's compassion fatigue. Um, uh, thank you so much for going into more detail about what compassion fatigue is and how it overlaps with, you know, the uh, synonym vicarious trauma, or also known as vicarious trauma. Um, Christina, would you also like to jump in on what are some ways of identifying when a law student or attorney might be affected by it and yes. methods of student being mindful? Absolutely. And I love this question so much because it, it really uh, resonates with me. I am a I work for a nonprofit. I serve individuals with developmental disabilities. I help them protect their rights and get access to benefits. And we have limited resources and can't help everyone. And it's utterly heartbreaking to tell somebody you can't help them. And as a supervisor, I have to make resource determinations. So two similarly situated children with special education needs, um, we can only directly represent one to hearing who gets those resources. And as a supervisor, I make those decisions because I won't ask my staff to do it. 
And the impact of that, especially if you're a very empathetic person, is, is exactly what Linda said. It's vicarious trauma. You start to feel the weight of it. Um, so what I've started doing as a lawyer in my legal practice every day, when I feel that compassion fatigue, when I feel that vicarious trauma, I try to take a moment to do something that grounds me. Um, numbing was a big thing for me in law school and in my early career as a lawyer, because I didn't want to feel what I was feeling. I didn't want to be in the moment. But what I have found is that centering myself in the moment does help. Um, always remember, you know, as a lawyer, no matter what you do, you're in a service profession. You take care of other people. You provide a resource to other people. But you can't help people until you help yourself. You cannot pour from an empty cup. And remember what you hear on, on, or we used to hear on planes when we could get on them and travel, you know, the stewardess or the flight attendant will tell you, put your mask on before assisting other people, including your own children. And the reason is, if you can't breathe, you can't help anyone, including your own children. So make sure, you know, in law school, in your legal practice, that you're taking those moments. I have, over the years, developed what I call my toolbox of, of, things I go to when I need, um, when I need to stop numbing, when I need to address my burnout. Um, one of the biggest things, and I'm very resentful about this, by the way, but one of the biggest things I have learned is that exercise will change your life. And I, I tried very hard to resist it. I was going to be the one person, the one person that exercise would not help my mental health. And I lost. Um, I now get up every single day and I walk before I work and it makes my day better on days when I can't walk because maybe I overslept. Um, it really does impact my mental health. Um, I also highly encourage just, just moments of absolute silliness. Take moments to do things that are nonsensical and don't require your brain. Uh, for me, sometimes that means I sit on my couch and I watch reruns of Bob's Burgers. I watch cartoons an adult woman who watches cartoons and it, it helps, it brings me back. Um, so find those things, those, those things to put in your toolbox so that you can, when you feel that compassion fatigue, you can address it and you can continue serving the people that you are supposed to be serving. Thank you so much for bringing in your own experience, but also some of your tool tips <laughs> that we may be also able to use. Um, Taryn, could you also chime in about um, compassion fatigue, how we can be mindful of it? Uh, and then afterwards, we'll be talking about coping mechanisms. Taryn, please. Yeah, so as a, as a therapist, uh, I've had to learn how to manage compassion fatigue. I wish that I had the tools I have now when I was a lawyer. Um, one thing that, one thing, well, several things that I do, but one thing that I do is about maintaining boundaries. Uh, we talk about this a lot, it's a lot in the zeitgeist, but it's actually really difficult to do, right? So boundary is around time, obviously billable hour, it's really, and then being in the service profession, you want to give and give and give, you want to give, right? And so putting, setting a boundary is one thing, you decide how I wanna set it, but enforcing the boundary, that's the difficult part, right? Because you have all these, your own wants, your own desires, but also outside pressure that's going to protest against your boundary. So learning how to accept that those protests are going to happen and prioritize your boundary anyway, um, that's something that takes a lot of practice. But the other thing, especially when I was a lawyer, it's not just the time boundary, but also boundary around thoughts right? You could be not working, but thinking, 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 what do I do for this client? What am I going to do for that client? Um, what if I can't help this client? And it's just, it can be endless if you're not mindful about it. And if you don't know how to um, shift your own focus, right? When people who go into law, we tend to be thinkers and we tend to have been rewarded heavily for being thinkers, for never stopping our thoughts. 
Um, and so learning how to choose where we put our attention takes a lot of practice, but it really does pay off in the end. Um, the other thing that I talk about a lot with my, you know, high pressure career clients with my Asian American clients is the difference between self-esteem and self-compassion. Um, I would highly recommend a book called Self-Compassion by Kristen Neff, who actually did her research at Berkeley. And just the first three chapters covers this amazing idea that self-esteem is the feeling of being the best, the feeling of being better than other people. And there was this we believed for a long time that self-esteem correlated with achievement and success. The problem with self-esteem is that it requires comparison to other people. It requires judging other people and judging ourselves. And you guys must know this by now, you will never be the best person in every room. It's just not possible. I tried for a very long time, but when we tie our self-worth to self-esteem, that means anytime we're not the best, we feel like we're the worst. We feel that sense of failure. Um, and so if we shift our self-worth from self-esteem to self-compassion, we worry that we lose that drive, that ambition, that motivation. Um, so, but here's, here's the analogy that I got from her book. If you're riding a horse and you fall off the horse, Self-esteem is, I can't believe I made that failure. I can't believe that I'm not the best at this. Obviously, if I fell off the horse, I'm no good. But if you fall off the horse and you say, you know what, that was a mistake. I'm going to learn from this. I'm still a worthy person. I can still be good at this. Which of those self-thoughts gives you more motivation and energy to get back on the horse? It's, it's going to be self-compassion. And that's also going to be one of those values that feels conflicting. So... Thank you but so I much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, thank you so thank you so much to our panelists who have talked about compassion fatigue, how to deal with it, how to identify it. Uh, we're going to be shifting over to our second part of our panel today, talking about seeking professional help and other resources that we may want. Um, for example, coping mechanisms. Um, Linda, we have a question in regards to a coping mechanism. Uh, we're now entering the section of the panel talking about resources and tools law students and lawyers can use to help with their mental health. What are some of the approaches you've seen that have helped individuals find success in their legal careers while maintaining their mental health? And what are some healthy coping mechanisms that students and attorneys can employ to deal with stress? Well, I, I love what, Karen, what you had to say um, in terms of just the self-compassion is an important thing. But in terms of dealing with just, you know, the students and the law students and lawyers in my practice that I work with, the number one thing, and a lot of this stuff sounds really easy. It sounds like, of course I know that, but I can't tell you how many things we can suggest that um, people don't do, don't follow through. So some, but I'm gonna go through this. So first of all, I think the most important thing to be successful and to moderate your stress is to really work at knowing yourself, knowing what's really important to you. You know, what are your values? Often like, why, why are you choosing to do this? Why did you go to law school? Um, I often say, put on blinders to other people. You know, try not to compare yourself to other people um, because like Karen said, you know, you're not gonna always be the number one in everywhere you go. It's just impossible. Like not every person in the world is gonna like you, okay? It just, it's just impossible. So it's really knowing what, again, back to your values can be the most important thing. But in terms of actual, you know, what to do kind of things, I think one of the most helpful things for at least for law students has been having a schedule that you, um, and I don't mean just a schedule of studying, I mean everything in your life, you know, scheduling your work, your, you know, your schoolwork, your free time, your putting in the, the more that you can feel as though you have some control over the way that you're living your life can reduce some of the stress. But I wanna really say that it's, so it's balancing, working with people on how to balance your life, because you know, there's more to your life than law school. 
like Karen was saying, being a lawyer, it's like all you do, your thoughts, you think about it, you think about it. the same with being, you know, a law student. It's like there's more to your life and make sure you remember who you were before you came to law school and what things you did to, you know, that were pleasurable and help you. Um, so I think I often tell students, you know, or, or people, period, try at least every single day to do one pleasurable thing for yourself. And we're not talking about it has to be big, just something little that you feel that makes you feel good. Um, some other things to deal with stress are also keeping what I call the gratefulness journal. Um, there is, or a piece of paper is that I ask, I ask my clients every day to write three to five things that you're grateful for. And there's some research to show that there's really a correlation between feeling more contented. Some people say even feeling happier because think about all the chatter in our head where we're criticizing ourselves or feeling like we didn't do the best. How often do we sit down and really look at what do we really appreciate? That also just really, really helps with stress. But then let's back to the basics, physical, you know, exercising, eating healthy, healthy, getting enough sleep. And what I hear often is, I don't have the time. I can't do that. I can't do that. And what I say is, you can't afford not to. If you don't take care of yourself, again, like Christina was saying, how can you take care of you know, anybody else? The investment. I think I, I heard a kind of a metaphor about if you were to buy yourself a fancy car, okay, whatever that means to you, you would take care of it. You'd wash it. You'd keep it clean. You'd look at it and admire it. That's your investment. Well, when you go to law school or when you're a lawyer or doing anything in life, you're the investment, okay? So it's like, if you don't take care of that investment yourself, you, 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 know, you won't be successful. And why would you not take care of yourself? So some of the real basics um, can help. And also the other thing to just be careful of, and I, sometimes I feel like I'm a mom talking to people, but watch, watch the alcohol and the drugs. Because I think we all know that it is a big problem in the in the legal field, so it's you know take care of yourself in other ways. And back to Christina, that toolbox, you need to have a number of different things that make you feel good about yourself. Because one thing doesn't always work at every time, depending about the situation. So carry your toolbox with a whole bunch of different things. Um, and I get, well, I could go on, I could go on and on and on. So let me, other people say something. <laughs> uh, so yes, thank you so much for that. Uh, we actually have quite a little bit, limited amount of time left in our panel and we wanna make sure everyone has a chance to talk. Um, so briefly, uh, could we, just talking briefly on coping mechanisms, wrapping up that section. Um, Karen, could you talk about what should happen if, a student or attorney um, has deals with stress in a very unhealthy manner and how you might want to bring that up to yourself or your colleague in a mindful and sensitive manner. Um, give me a mind that we have limited time still. So. Yeah, um, I used to talk about this with my lawyer friends in law school and when I was working. Um, a lot of, you know, alcohol substance abuse is really normalized in our, mm -hmm. in our profession. And so I actually found it quite easy if we, if I talked about it in terms of myself, do I think I'm drinking too much? Am I using this to cope rather than for bonding, for, you know, experiences with my friends? And that would easily engage in a conversation with everyone. How do we know we're doing it too much? Um, I think that's, kind of the most sensitive way in is to really focus it on yourself and then have a conversation that's totally non-judgmental. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, we really would love to hear more about um, some of the topics we've already discussed, but I'm gonna hand it over to Marjan. Um, Marjan is going to be talking about seeking professional help and stigmatization. Marjan? Right on, yeah, I, I mean, just did on Karen. I love the idea of just checking in with yourself and making sure that, you know, you're, you have time to reflect on, on what's happening around you and what's happening internally. 
Um, yeah, but speaking of professional help and stigmatization, um, I, I had a question for Dr. Zaruba. Um, in what ways do Philippinex culture and seeking professional counseling interact? And I guess more specifically, when is it an appropriate time to seek professional help? I think that's something that we're a little bit caught up on is kind of getting to that point of like recognizing when it's time. Well, I think, it, as I said earlier, the, the more that you know yourself and pay attention to your feelings, okay, your feelings and your thoughts, and when you feel like uncomfortable, or let's, let's just say easily, like more negative, think about why am I feeling this way? I want to feel better. What do I need? Um, and to, you know, the stigma, I think the more, I think mental health is a lot more um, available now and a lot more talked about so that I, I find that um, people that used to be uncomfortable, I see a lot of people that come to my office, well, before COVID, okay, now on Zoom, and they'll say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I've never thought about doing this before. Um, because of the stigma and they'll talk about that and it's just really you know there's the, I think the only thing you can do is as mental health professionals is be out there be positive in terms of and your personality being in counseling or therapy is like not being afraid to be vulnerable okay that going to get help is really a strength and the sooner you do it when you feel like I'm just not feeling right I could use some support and you don't have to think about it. We're going into deep, you know, um, mental uh, that are mentally ill. It's more like I could use some coaching and some support in how to how to feel better and do this better. Um, I don't. No, I, I love that. I, I love, you know, just being able to lean into your discomfort, and it's totally okay to be vulnerable. Um, mm -hmm. I think law school, especially through the different intersections and identities that we have, like sometimes we put that wall up, um, but it's totally fine. And just to be able to destigmatize and demystify what that looks like is really helpful. Um, thank you, Dr. Zaruba. I'm gonna ask a similar question to Christina. I Earlier on, you mentioned your toolkit of resources. And I think that fits very well into this question of seeking professional help. Um, how do you see that interplay kind of happen both, you know, the things that you have picked up, as well as um, how to get that professional help, figuring out what works, what doesn't work. I'd love your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, I think, so for many, many years, up until I was 32, I swore up and down that I would never go to therapy, that therapy was for people who aren't like me. Pe people, some people really need therapy. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> and at the age of 32, I was just in a really rough place with my anxiety and my depression. And I said, you know what? It can't hurt to try. And I've had the same therapist ever since. I preach the gospel of therapy because at this point, she has helped me through so much. And I now go to her as kind of a maintenance thing. I see her once a month because it helps me. And I grew up in an Irish Catholic family where we don't talk about our feelings. There's a lot of guilt and shame around it. Um, I, I understand that some of uh, that Catholicism has ma made its way to uh, the Philippines. So that culture is there too. And I think no matter where you go, what country it's in, Catholicism is full of shame and guilt. Um, so those things were really rooted in me. Um, now, and I do have to say that this is a very humbling experience for me as a white woman to be invited to talk at uh, a panel like this um, because you know, I can share my experiences with you and I know my experiences are different because of my culture and because of the color of my skin. And this is just really, really humbling to talk about. But what I want you to know is that you are not weak for seeking help. You are not broken because you need a professional. My best friend who actually identifies as a Filipina, um, she said to me when I started seeing my therapist, if your car was broken, would you fix it yourself? No, I wouldn't. I'd go to a professional who knows how to fix cars. So um, 
you don't know how to fix your mental health. There are these wonderful people who are also on this panel who specialize in helping people with their mental health and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and I think the way we confront the stigma is by you know, having more of these conversations, bringing these brilliant women who've come to speak to you about mental health, about their profession, taking their feedback and you know, especially the feedback that you've, you've gotten from Roanne and Karen who can speak from the cultural perspective. Um, these are all strong, brilliant women and they're telling you it's okay to take care of yourself. It's okay to find help. It's okay to be compassionate to yourself. So, you know, don't do what I did and not listen to all those brilliant people. Listen to them now and your, your legal career is going to be so much smoother if you're willing to ask for help. Yeah, right, right. Period. <laughs> um, I, I think this is a, you know, you, you brought up the concept of like growing up in an Irish Catholic family. And I think that that's a very similar cultural layer that we face. And I really want to share or ask this last question before we round out our panel to Ruan, um, just talking about stigma and that intersection between Philippinex culture, um, Catholic culture for those who observe it and you know, in some instances, the hyphenated version of both. Um, and it does play an enormous role in our culture and our, our diaspora, uh, and not to mention the legal profession develops its own culture of high-performing stress balls. So I'm wondering if, there, if, if one significant problem for mental health for this group is a perception of stigma and what are your thoughts on that? And how do you think law students think about this kind of in that whole context? Muted. Yeah, certainly there is still stigma, but I think it's softening uh, a lot more. Um, um, you know, in, in the Filipino language, I'll say it and then do the translation. Ko anong puno siyang bunga, whatever the tree, the fruit shall be, is a very embedded um, cultural core value that many of the immigrant may not even know that they're acting on that. But, um, and, and so they're so connected. Um, the shadow of that is enmeshed with their children that when their children may, may need to seek support, um, they, they may sense that as a failure of their role as a parent. So that's, there's a projection. So many Filipino Americans, when they do decide to share that, oh, mom, you know, I'm seeking therapy, um, they might get a backlash. Um, just know that we don't have a lot of models around that. You know, they're not familiar with that. In the motherland, the mental, ha mental health uh, law or act was just passed a few years ago, which meant it was not really part of our, uh, our health system. So it's something new. Um, when you think about the image of what uh, someone looks like if they are seeking mental health, the image of an immigrant, what they would bring up is very different. So they don't have any model. But um, the truth is once you, um, many of the clients that I see, they're just uh, in that journey when the parents see that it's benefiting them, um, they, the parents convince themselves that, oh, this isn't so bad. In fact, I've had uh, immigrant parents um, join us in our session. I think for me as a therapist is when I'm giving a good experience as far as uh, the, the platform of therapy, of healing, uh, that's the best um, commercial, if you will. That's the best because they pass that on. Um, they're like, wow, this isn't, isn't so bad. Like what Linda was saying, you know, it could just be coaching. You're just seeking for support. And then um, if religion, you know, in the back of your head, oh my gosh, you know, it's like, I, I shouldn't be feeling this way. I could just pray. Yeah, you could do that. You know, you don't have to choose. You could pray and seek therapy. So. Well, thank you. Wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Marjan, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I just wanna say thank you to all of our panelists. Um, thank you for sharing your insight, personal and professional experiences and your compassion. I also wanna thank 
the uh, committee for putting this together. I know that um, Danny, Jamie, Gabby, Janice, Antonio, we really, it really does take a village to put this program together. I'm really happy for everybody's presence and to sharing space with us. I'm gonna give it to Janice now. Thank you so much to all of you. I am getting a lot of feedback about how much your comments and insights are resonating with our participants. I would like to do therapy with each of you. Thank you so much for everything. Um, now we're gonna go on to our next panel starting in one minute. Um, again, you have a choice between two panels, 2A and 2B. One is for uh, success in your summer jobs, that's 2A, and the other is 2B, um, success as a POC attorney. And you can go to the Community God website, there it is in the chat, and pick the right link for you for the next panel. Thank you so much.